Okay, so welcome to the third lecture, Cultural Anthropology, Methods, and Two Old Guys Who Use Them. Now, parts of this will certainly be a review, but these concepts are so important that it's not a terrible thing that I talk about them multiple times. So one of the things that people find confusing about cultural anthropology, and frankly, I find it a little confusing too, is that we make uh, most often two different kinds of studies. And those two different kinds of studies are very similar words, unfortunately. So an ethnography, which we've talked about last time, is a detailed account of a culture. This can refer to both the written document and the actual study. Now, so that what that means is that I can go out and do ethnography, and then when I come home, I write an ethnography. It is both a verb and a noun. It is both the action of studying people and the report that I write when I get back. Now, the other uh, type of document that anthropologists often write is an ethnology. An ethnology is a written study in which two cultures are compared and contrasted, two or more, actually. Now, this is becoming more and more rare, in my opinion, but it does happen. Technically, we'll talk about a book later called The Gift. It is one of the first ethnologies, in my opinion, um, in which <clears throat> Marcel Mauss takes and looks at the social norms surrounding uh, gifts and gift giving in several different cultures so that he's comparing gift giving uh, norms uh, from one culture to the next. So in that case, that is an ethnology. Ethnographies about one culture, ethnologies compare two or more cultures. So a few more terms that you can use to apply to ethnography include holistic. Um, so an ethnography is a holistic attempt to study the entire culture or subculture. It doesn't have to be, but often it is. And holistic is one of those words that often gets to apply to anthropology in general. Holistic means it is characterized by a comprehension of the parts of something as intimately interconnected and explicable only by reference to the whole. Wow, what a definition, right? Um, basically what we mean is that we find it difficult to understand social norms surrounding perhaps elevator culture if you don't understand uh, the social norms in the greater culture of the United States of America, right? So if you think about elevators, we do something really strange in elevators, right? We get into an elevator, uh, you face towards the door, and you get as far apart from anybody as you can, and it's not recommended that you talk in elevators. Right, but to understand why we do these strange things in elevators, which is we don't talk to strangers, we all face the door, and you have to get as far apart from other people in the elevator as possible, it has to do with a greater sense of proxemics in the United States in general. That in general, people in the United States tend to stand as far away from each other as possible when talking, when interacting. We have a large kind of bubble that we keep around ourselves. So the argument is that if you want to understand why we do that in elevators, you have to understand how we do that throughout our culture overall, that effectively in the US, we tend to stand really far away from each other. Um, so the point being that to really understand one small aspect of a culture, you need to understand that cultures and their social norms are interconnected to one another, and you have to have at least an elementary understanding of that social norm throughout the culture as a whole. Right. So that's what anthropologists tend to do. We try to get a holistic understanding of social norms, of cultural attributes that we study. And by doing that, we need to kind of understand the whole culture or at least the pertinent parts. Now, that's kind of contrary to what sometimes other scientists do. Right. Scientists, hard scientists try to isolate a phenomenon, control all the variables, avoid bias, and then understand that aspect without those things interfering. It's difficult for an anthropologist to do because we recognize that parts of cultures are interconnected and to understand one small part, we might need to understand a larger part, right? So maybe I've talked about that more than I should, but you get the idea, right? That we try to understand the entire culture uh, to understand one small aspect of a culture. Thus, we are holistic. Ethnographic fieldwork involves extended time spent with the culture under study. This time can range from three months to a year or even more. Um, and early on and during the Heroes and Villains lecture, there were some people I called out as being armchair anthropologists. And I explained that that's kind of an insult to anthropologists. Um, and it's because we require fieldwork. As your textbook states, we study people doing something somewhere, right? And if you want to learn about the things they do at that somewhere, you probably ought to go there. 
right? So the point being that trying to understand any aspect of a culture in any time less than three months certainly won't work. So the next few brief slides come by from a paper by Whitehead written in 2005. Uh, there's an example of me using citation because I'm using information from his paper. A lot of these things that Whitehead spells out um, in his methodology for ethnography are pretty obvious, but it's worth talking about. So we'll spend the next few slides kind of going through how anthropologists prepare and uh, conduct uh, ethnography, anthropological fieldwork. So anytime you do science of any sort, frankly, uh, the first and most essential and somewhat obvious step is you need to read everything you can get your hands on concerning that study. Right, so you need to read previously written studies on the culture that you wish to study. You may find that somebody has already studied the aspect of a culture that you wanted to study and that maybe you don't need to do it. You may find that somebody has already studied the exact aspect of a culture you want to study, but their results don't make any sense to you. And in reading their paper, you realize, hey, you know, I can approach this differently and do better. Right, and this certainly isn't exclusive to anthropologists, all scientists have to do a ton of reading on the subject that they want to research, hard science, soft science, social science, biology, physics, I don't care what it is, to make sure that somebody else hasn't A, already done the thing they want to do, and B, um, reading can be a way to generate the questions you want. For instance, when I wrote my master's thesis on stone tools, I read a uh, master's thesis by a colleague of mine named Kim Redman, and she suggested the exact question that I then tried to answer in my thesis. And I gave her credit for it. I said, Redman posed this question in 1998, and now I'm going to try to answer it in 2009, right? So a lot of people after doing research go, you know, I did this and I did that and this ways it worked and this ways it doesn't work. But now after doing this, I realize what I really should have asked is this question. And that happens all the time in science and anthropology. So first you have to read to generate your research questions and make sure somebody hasn't already answered it. Second, you need to read to prepare yourself to live amongst and or interact with these people. Um, take an example from my recent trip to Costa Rica. Uh, in most Spanish-speaking countries, uh, the U form, tu, uh, is the informal version, and usted is the formal version, but amongst, amongst Costa Rican cu culture, pretty much everybody used o usted, so I went around using tu, as I was th taught to do in my Spanish class, and that was kind of almost insulting. Had I done a little background reading on Costa Rican culture and looked into how they speak the Spanish language, I could have avoided that. And that's the kind of thing that you can avoid by doing this preparatory reading. You need to know that, you know, bringing up this subject amongst these people is not polite, right? Because the worst thing you can do is do something terribly, horribly polite, impolite to the people you're studying and then get kicked out, right? So you need to know what you need to do, their rules, and try not to violate them. And the way to figure that out is do background reading on the people. So as previously mentioned, field work is absolutely essential uh, for anthropology. During the field work, the anthropologist works with a host population, the people under study, and Whitehead defines the host population as members of the cultural system being studied, and that's found on page five, right? So that's pretty obvious that you need to work, you need to define the group of people you're going to work with. You can't say, hey, I'm going to look at um, the culture of the United States. Well, yeah, there's 300 and plus 360 million plus of us. I don't know the exact number off the top of my head, but it's a lot of people. Um, so you need to subdivide and define who you're going to work with and how you're going to define that culture uh, before you set out. Interviews are a crucial part of cultural anthropology. And here on the right, we see uh, Margaret Mead interviewing people during her field work. Um, it is required in Whitehead's view that you learn the language spoken by the members of your culture. If you can't do that, at least hire a very good interpreter, right? And you have to think about the interpreter you hire. For instance, if you were a female anthropologist studying uh, gender norms in a culture and you hire a male interpreter, the people in that culture might not be willing to say the same things in front of that male interpreter that they would have been willing to say in front of you, the female anthropologist. And so you have to realize that that interpreter is essentially another barrier between you and the information you want. So if possible, you want to learn to speak the language. If impossible, carefully select an interpreter who meets your and matches with your research goals and definitely spend some time thinking about that. 
So interviews are key. You can interview individuals, right, to learn about their perspective, or you can interview groups of people, households of people, families of people, young women in a village, young men in a village, um, because sometimes people are more likely to say things in a one-on-one -on -one interview, and sometimes people are more likely to say certain things in group interviews, that effectively who is involved in that interview can affect what they're willing to tell you uh, and how they're going to tell it, right? So keep in mind that people, when being interviewed or surveys, or surveyed, try to please the person that they're talking to. They try to stay on subjects that they think that person wants to hear about, and they try to impress that person in most cases. So believe it or not, one-on-one -on -one interviews versus group interviews can result in very different information being gained. So you always have to think about the dynamic of the interview that you're doing, who's involved, what information you may get because of who's involved or who's not involved. Right. So it seemed rather easy. You just pick a person, and you talk to him, you ask him about a thing. But there's a lot of thought that goes into who you interview, when you enter them, when you interview them and who you interview them with. So there's a special kind of interview called a life history. It's my very favorite kind of interview. And essentially, Black Elk Speaks, the book I'm asking you to read, is a life history. Um, of course, it got translated and then written down by Nyhart, but effectively that's what it is. And an interview, a life history is just when you go, hey, you know, what have you done in your life? You just ask one open question. Now, when you ask people, most people in the United States, like, what do you do? You know, what have you done in your life? They're going to tell you basically the same things, that, that, that what you tell somebody when that you are asked about yourself in a very general way is mostly culturally determined. So here in the U.S., we'd say, you know, I'm a professor. You know, I study archaeology. I'm married. I don't have any kids, and I have a dog, and I own a house. Right. So basically, that's the kind of script you expect me to give you when you ask, well, what do you do, Justin? Right. And that varies from one culture to the next. And in fact, um, what that person chooses to tell you tells you about their culture and it tells you about them, right? So giving them the ability to choose when you just ask them, hey, what do you do? What, what's up with your life? What have you done in your life? That tells you what they think is important, right? That kind of open-ended question means that you can figure out culturally what is important to them because they're going to answer with those things. Uh, in many cultures, the first person that somebody says is, I'm a father of two, right? Whereas we tend to, in our culture, tell you about our careers. And that's a mark of us being in an industrialized country that really prides ourselves on what we do for a living, right? Even the way that question is phrased informs you that we put a lot of importance on employment. Um, in other cultures, they may sell it, tell you about their ancestors, right? Those who practice ancestor worship. Well, I'm the son of this person who is the son of this person who is the son of this person who did these great deeds, right? And they may never get to the fact that they work in a hardware store because they're too busy telling you about their ancestors. The next quote down there, life story research emphasizes the truth of telling versus telling the truth. Right. So, for instance, you know, every time I tell the story of me doing field work and um, us finding a cougar up in the mountains, that cougar just gets a little closer to me and a little closer to almost eating me. Right. That that I am trying to impress you when I tell you that story by saying that that cougar was just right there when in reality, the cougar may have been 20 or 30 feet away. Um, right. So what you tend to lie about, what you tend to overemphasize when you're telling a life history tells you a lot about that person's culture. Like what do they think they need to tell you? What do what truths do they need to stretch to impress you? Right? So that's what that quote means. Life history research emphasizes the truth of telling versus telling the truth. Right? And there's Black Elk is a wonderful, wonderful example of that. I truly believe that in some parts of that book, Black Elk and maybe Nyhart stretches the truth a bit right and sometimes where you choose to lie and what you choose to say to try to impress the listener tells you more about the culture than the actual truth of the story if that makes any sense so we've talked about these perspectives before but they de it's worth repeating uh emic is the insider's perspective edict is the outsider's perspective right um, these two terms were adopted from the work of Kenneth Lee Pike in the 1950s. He was using it to describe methods to understand language. Anthropologists and social scientists in general have really run with these terms because, as mentioned previously, edict, outsiders, unbiased opinions is what most hard scientists try to do. They're going to put something under a fume hood 
they're going to get all these controls for their experiment. We don't have that luxury in anthropology, right? And we try to get the insider's perspective. So in many ways, that makes us biased, and we're kind of okay with that. But in reality, as I suggested uh, last time, the truth of, of it is somewhere between the insider and outsider's point of view. So anthropologists, along with other social scientists, but probably anthropologists more than anybody, we cross the line between the insider's and outsider's perspective. Sometimes we use the outsider's perspective. Sometimes we use the insider's perspective. Sometimes we try to use both. Uh, we will jump back and forth, and we're kind of fine with that, right? And it's, it's really hard to do. But we recognize that, that the inside cultural perspective and the outside cultural perspective can both be useful, and you have to know when to use which. So again, anthropologists are kind of famous, infamous for using the emic perspective. Uh, when doing anthropology, you should do both, right? That reality, in my opinion, and the opinion of many anthropologists is somewhat in between. But how to use one and when to use the other is a very complicated question. Certainly not something I want you to come out of this cultural anthropology class understanding. Um, some days I wonder if I understand it myself. But it's something to think about, right? And especially in our culture where the edict perspective is everything, where the outsider, unbiased, controlled perspective is what you've come to expect in science, what you've come to demand from status, uh, statistical studies, and you should. Uh, but in reality, uh, understanding, at least in the social science sense, in my opinion, comes from a combination of the two. So terms that I've tossed around and claim to be related to emic and edict perspectives are the objective and subjective. Uh, you can equate subjective uh, perspectives with emic and objective <laughs> perspectives with etic, the outsider's perspective. Uh, and anthropologists often ask the question, can somebody truly be objective? Can you be free of bias? And we're not sure. Um, so. The perspective that is more objective, of course, is edic, and the perspective that is more subjective, of course, is emic. Um, and many anthropologists have asked the question, should anthropologists even attempt to be objective? Can we do it? Can we remove our own culture brilla, our own culture glasses from ourselves when studying another culture? I'm not sure. Anthropologists have used a method called participant observation. It's one of those easy things to understand. You observe while participating. Uh, it's an anthropological method in which the anthropologist joins the culture they study. The anthropologist does everything those people do and takes notes while doing it. It is the ultimate of emic field methods. And Boaz and, to a lesser extent, Malinowski really started the ball rolling on this um, and were really important in developing. Malinowski is often called the father of ethnography. He used a more scientific edic method, though he also did emic inquiries. Um, and so often you'll hear Boaz or Malinowski associated with the beginning of this. Malinowski lived in Britain and Boaz lived in North America.